podcast double what? click the record button <laughs> that's yeah. not bad what would it be about though podcasting the history of buttons oh that's very meta a podcast about podcasting the history of buttons yeah, yeah. there's pod on pod i don't know if you guys have heard that but it's a podcast yeah. where they review other podcasts oh that sounds great i'd never listen to it but i'm glad it exists so. i would listen to it <laughs> if, if i like the host if i didn't like the host i wouldn't listen welcome to pros and cons a podcast by writers for writers brought to you by precipice fiction Precipice Fiction would like to acknowledge the people of the Eora and Dorag Nations as the original custodians and storytellers of the land this podcast was created on. Three, two, one. Welcome to Pros and Cons, the Precipice Fiction podcast. The podcast by emerging writers for emerging writers, because sometimes we feel like pros and sometimes, what do we feel like, guys? Cons, we feel Penguins. like cons. That, thank you. Thank penguins. you for humoring me. I said penguins. And sometimes, sometimes like penguins. we feel like penguins. I'm Patty Boylan, the hosting penguin. Joining me at my esteemed penguins, Alex Eldridge. Hello. Uh, I'm head penguin at the Penguin Begrade. Begra- right. Begra- uh, yeah, I do a lot of um, sliding down icebergs. Uh, there's a lot of like <laughs> making <laughs> sounds and flat. Mo- no, I'm an author. Uh, I, uh, I've, I've written for a few publications uh, and I've also contributed to the, the new mythic most re- recently. Beautiful. I do and like my, penguins, though. And my second co-penguin, Matana Law. I've always been wanted to be called uh, a co-penguin by someone. You made <laughs> Now's your lucky day, Matan. <laughs> That's my lucky day. My flippers are just shivering with excitement. Oh, and I can see them. Beyond my uh, current predicament of being a penguin, I'm also an English teacher and a writer. I've contributed to a new mythic, uh, like Alex. Uh, I like to write horror and fantasy. And I'm also doing a bachelor in English literature uh, at university. So, yeah. Lots of classics to read. Lots of classics and lots of penguin-based literature, I'm sure. And I'm Patty Boylan, hosting for today. I'm a part-time penguin, part-time... What do I do? Part-time editor, <laughs> uh, part-time creative writing teacher, and part-time technical writer. And I'm currently looking for more work. So if you need a technical writer who's also a penguin, you, you know where to look. <laughs> Is that uh, the, the same penguins, mate? Yeah, surely. Yeah, surely. Sure. They must do. Probably. Years of teaching, uh, watching Pingu has taught me this much. So today, guys, penguins, we're looking at character arcs. Does either of you want to give a brief definition of what you understand a character arc to be? Yeah, I'll do Ooh. it. I'll do it. Go. Okay. So the idea of an arc is uh, you start here and then you go up like that and you go over like that. I'm being entirely serious. Uh, basically, yeah. your character is starting at one point. And they're kind of uh, traversing a space that might be a moral space, that might be a physical space, Mm. um, going from one point to the other. So they're going to end up somewhere different. They're going to be a changed person by the time they get to the other side of the arc is functionally what it is. It's humans like to see other humans change and grow, whether that be, uh, you know, in a positive sense or a negative sense. And that's all an arc is essentially. A hell of a definition. That, Thank that's you. That's very good. I think we can end the podcast there. Can, can I give <laughs> you right. a less professional definition? Yes. A much less pro- uh, You know Red Riding Hood? Yes. She's never walking in a forest alone ever again. Oh, <laughs> oh that's yeah. That's character arc. Oh, yeah. Okay, that, that's fair. That's real good. Yeah. yeah. It's pretty it's, good. It's when the reality of a character hits the reality of the world they're in and changes happen. And character arcs are so... I don't know what you guys, maybe you're always got them on your mind, but for me, they're so easy to forget to add. They can often be an afterthought, but they do so much heavy lifting because a character that doesn't change over the course of a story, if the story is of enough length, feels often kind of flat. We don't feel like the story's moving. We don't feel like there's a change from here to there. And it feels like the place we end up in is often kind of the same place we start mm-hmm. and not in a fun, the story is a circle, this is the monomyth kind of way. So today... We're going to look at character arcs, different types of them, when we need them, why we need them, and when we might when we might not need them. Because maybe we don't always need character arcs. But spoilers, most of the time we do. So before we jump into this, uh, guys, what have, you been, what have you been reading or watching or playing in the literary I'm, world? I'm so tempted to say happy feet, just for the <laughs> penguin thing. I have watched happy feet. I've actually never seen though. it. It's directed by the same oh, guy who did Fury Road. I know. I, I <laughs> what? That, that yeah, was that up, really? That's insane. It's crazy. How? Yeah, what, yeah, what yeah. yeah. Of Philly, I'm a, Philly. Because uh, Miller anyway. is a, a, an and, and Babe um, and Babe Pig in the City as well, actually. 
I think he did. Wow, types. talk about yeah, you did, know, yeah. like two sides to a coin. Yeah. Um. Anyway, I've been reading uh, the importance of being earnest by oh, Oscar nice. Wilde. Hey, it's a classic. Nice. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, I read it for school. I'm not some you know fancy schmancy guy. I just I have to read it, and I am enjoying it. Uh, it did make me Google cucumber sandwiches this morning because mm. they make a big fuss of them, and I thought, what's so great about a cucumber sandwich? And mm. it's literally just bread, cucumber, and a thin layer of cream cheese. No, anyway, it's also to... the backbone of the British Empire. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Right, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Wait, but hang on, hang on. What sort of cream cheese? Are we talking cottage? Are we talking Philadelphia? Like, whoa, 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 whoa. cottage is not cream cheese. Listeners, do not listen to this. Cottage okay. has nothing to do with cream cheese. It's a creamy cheese. Uh, back, <laughs> controversy. Back to the story. The the point of the story. I'm going to spoil it because it's from like 120 years ago. I'm allowed, right? Yeah. Uh, so this guy, basically, you have two characters, and both of them have double identities. They have uh -huh. uh, two different names. Mm. to basically push their agenda one of them is literally called jack in the countryside and ernest in the city if i remember correctly i'm still not done with the book and he's basically pretending that his other identity i believe is his uh, friend or sibling and it, it's very funny it's it's very absurd in a way and it's kind of making fun of the seriousness of, of victorian england in a way that i think is really clever and and hilarious uh, and he proposes to this lady who says, well, of course I'll marry you. You have the perfect name. And that's actually not his name. And he's like, surely you would marry me if my name was different. It's like, no, no, no. If your name was not Ernest, I would definitely not marry you. Okay. And he's like, well, what if my name was Jack? No, no. Jack is the worst name a guy can have. I would never <laughs> marry a Jack. And I'm just sitting there reading it like, okay, that's that's pretty cool. That's clever. Yeah. Uh, highly recommended. Pretty short. It's okay. kind of like a, a Prince and the Pauper sort of thing, isn't it? Like, like the, the two, like switching identities kind of vibe. Yeah, but exactly. But he kind of separates his, his worlds. One world is only familiar with Jack. One world is only familiar right. with Ernest. And God forbid, they, God forbid they meet. That's the worst thing that can happen to him. Okay. Mm. Beautiful. I've, I've never read it. It's something that I've always been aware of. But um, if you recommend it, maybe I should. Right? Yeah, yeah exactly. Cool. In the yeah, literary it's good, it's periphery. Cool. I'm going to add it to my enormous list. Mm -hmm. All right. Very cool. Bring in some culture. Alex, what about you? <laughs> yeah. Uh, on the other side of the the, um, <laughs> the, the spectrum, uh, yeah. in terms of what culture and, and, even, and even what fictionality, reading, what, what could he be reading? I've been reading Masters of Doom. I've actually been listening to it. I'm not going to say reading because I, I want okay. to destigmatize listening to audiobooks. Um, yeah, I've been listening to Masters of Doom, which is... Basically about a biopic about the two guys who started uh, id Entertainment, Ooh. the the uh, video game company that created Doom. And man, is that a bloody great character study uh, mm. in in terms of like these two these two developers, the two Johns, John Carmack and John Romero. Romano. And it's just yeah, yeah, it's just how they kind of rose to fame from being these geeky like the developer guys to basically like owning the shareware market and then like just selling millions of copies, having of course a big fallout. Then the second half's about how one guy gives themselves the company and it's a complete night. Like they break up and they start a company. It's just, a, it's a great book. Really, would, really good book. Would you say that there are solid character arcs throughout? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yes, I would. Yeah. I, I really would, but I, I, it is non-fictional, so it's it's easy to put that down to uh, the skill of the writer. The writer is really good. He's a really good writer. Yep. I've, um, but no, it, like, yeah, great characters. Really, really good. Like fire and ice sort of dynamic. Like it's just about these two guys and the, the dynamic of their relationship. Uh, and that's made me go down this whole video game production rabbit hole. And I've just been really, nice. really leaning into that the last couple of days, really obsessively. So, yeah. Amazing. Uh, that actually sounds like a really solid read. It's, and it's great. It's incredible. ID Software looms pretty large on anyone who one is a gaming nerd, which is I don't know what what percentage of our audience would you say that would be? A quarter? I'd say forty percent at least. Let's say forty percent. So character arcs are everywhere, including in situations like that story. And part of the reason why they're so effective in fiction is because they mirror real life, right? I mean, yeah, what you read is real life. But if fiction doesn't have it, it doesn't feel true. 
because like we all change. We're not even the same person that we were at the beginning of the year as to now. And over the course of 10 years, people, people change substantially. Mm. Um, I certainly know I have, but apart from that, apart from the fact that it makes characters feel more real, what, what are some other reasons why we want to give our characters arcs? You guys, you guys got anything off the top of the mind for this? Cause I have a few. Um, okay. So a character arc basically gives you an opportunity to, um, delve into the very, we, we always talk about wanting to have complex characters, characters that have complexity, that have different layers. Um, there's, there's a lot of ways you can, you can go into that, but one of them is, is just temporal, like just going through a timeline of a person and seeing how, you know, what, what different states they inhabit over the different portions of their life. So yeah. no, no man is, or no person I should say is the same even day to day. So you can't help but see these different sides of a character that kind yeah. of flesh them out as they go through their, their life, be that over the course of a day or a week or several years. Yeah, I think um, we get a more full version of, uh, of someone if we can see them over time, right? Yeah. We're not just who we are in one time, we're who we are over the course of our lives. Yeah, good point. I think a good character arc is also a testament to your plot and the significance of the events taking place in your novel. Because when something big happens, you're affected by it. We can see it in real life, like traumatic events, uh, maybe significant successes. If if something that happened in your story does not affect your character or who they are, it's almost like this big thing happened and, and there's no footprint, there's no echo of it. And when a character is affected by the events of the story, it kind of mm. lends more credibility to how impactful the story is. For example, mm. if you are writing a vengeance story and someone you know loses his family at the opening scenes or midway through, if your character is not changed by that experience... First of all, it makes me feel like the experience is not that that important, right? Yeah. He's basically the same guy. He talks the same. He walks the same. He breathes the same. So maybe he wasn't affected. Hmm. So really, you can look at character arcs as like this improvement, uh, escalation thing. But it's also, I think, uh, a conversation with the events of your story. Your characters are reacting to things. It's like a back and forth between what is happening to them and how they are changed by it. Naturally... Hmm. We try to, at least in a traditional sense, we try to position it like an arc, right? We have the lowest moment, the change, the it kind of goes in a way that's very aesthetic, but it doesn't have to be that way. It can be like a, a heart monitor, like ups and downs, ups and downs the whole the whole way. And that to me can just reflect the the highs and lows of the story. Yeah. I, I think that's those are perfect answers that, that yeah. covered pretty much all the points I have. The only the only other one I have is that I think it makes characters more relatable. Uh, when we see a character go through those rises and falls and experience pain and react to pain, stuff like that, it, it makes them put ourselves in that position. It's hard to emote to a character that doesn't. Well, let me give you an example. When we were watching the Batman film, and granted, you know, he changed at the very beginning, but there's yeah. there's no character change after that. Did either of you relate to Batman? No. Feel? He's a pretty, he's a pretty, like, because he's a comic book character, he's yeah. almost necessarily static. Yeah. Um, mm. So Christian Bale's a great actor, uh, but uh, he's. I think Batman's a. Uh, he's only functional in in relation to his foils with other with vi villains. Essentially, that's what's interesting about him. Um, yeah. So I'd say not so much. I think you could write a Batman that does have an arc, um, but you are right that in general it's a character that very naturally leans towards highlighting the foils like alex says because he's so static because he's he is batman he's a paragon he's he maxed out basically this is who he needs to be yeah so basically it's the people uh, that come against him that naturally become more interesting because you know batman is not going to change much he's not going to change his costume he's not going to change his methods he's not going to suddenly kill and he's not going to suddenly go to the police to report a crime so you're more interested to see how do people challenge this immovable object mm. and you know yeah. that in the end he's probably going to stay the same yeah I, I like that there's almost no room for change because yeah he has mapped out his stats like he is the final form of what of what he is <laughs> yeah he's the, uh, uh, he's the apotheosis of of this of the superhero in a lot of ways yeah. you could argue for yeah. su superman as well but he is he is the the end form like the the final version of what 
a superhero can kind of be, at least on that on that wavelength. Yeah. That's the thing. If you want to do a Batman arc, it usually has to be like, I don't know how closely you guys watch comics, but there's this arc when Bane defeats him and breaks his back. Happens in the movies, happen in the comics. Uh, so basically the arc for someone like Batman is to stop being Batman. And then he's returned to being Batman. Yeah, he, yeah, yeah. He loses his ability to be Batman because his back is physically broken. He's mentally broken. So that's his arc to to stop being himself. And, and the only way they can get an arc in yes yeah, to stop him is to make him not Batman. I, yeah. I like that. It's we've, binary. We've incidentally kind of jumped ahead to some later points I have about when might you want one character arc. But let's uh, this this is good. Let's let's put a pin on this and let's uh return after we thank thank you for putting the pin in. After we have looked at the different types of character arc, because we're human beings, we love to put things in categories, and unsurprisingly, people have categorized different kinds of arcs, and here they are. Now, listen, as you're listening to this, you might think that there are other kinds or subkinds. That's fine. There's so many ways to divide this, but this is one simple framework that I like that I think describes all the different types of arc pretty broadly. Here we go. Okay. First of all, we have the moral ascending character arc. The moral ascending. Pretty obvious, right? Did one of you guys... I'm, look, I'm sure you can guess what that is based on the name. One of you guys want to want to pitch a description of that? Uh, Tangled. I haven't seen Tangled. <laughs> no, Tangled, the what, 2016 what movie. Disney movie. Okay, so there's Rapunzel. She's got the her business. You know Rapunzel. Yeah. And this guy named Lynn Ryder kind of tries to come into her house and steal her shit. And... Starts off as this robber, Lynn falls Ryder. in love with her. <laughs> Suddenly, Such... you know, starts to have morals, principles. It's amazing what a beautiful pair of eyes would do to a guy. Uh, so yeah, by the end of it, he refuses to steal. He turns on his robber friends and becomes an upstanding citizen. Beautiful. That's that's a perfect example of a moral ascending character arc. The one I had in mind was Han Solo. Starts as or a rogue and a scoundrel. Mm. Honestly, he's like chaotic like that. neutral. He is, but toward the end of the first Star Wars film, spoilers, he actually returns and saves the day, even though he was saying like, no, I'm not going to risk my skin for anyone but me. But he does in the end because of the power of friendship. It's, look, so often moral ascending character arcs come down to the power of friendship, <laughs> which is fine. Which is yeah, fine. Friendship fair. is great. It's but, fair. Yeah. It's, it's when a character improves morally. Or yeah. they overcome some moral adjacent failing in themselves when someone mm. is no longer a coward and they stand up to a bully. Is it a moral thing? Eh, kind of, but it rhymes with the morally adjacent, uh, the morally ascending character arc. So we're going to put it in the same bucket. So a character improves morally uh, on themselves. Great, nice and quick. Anything else to add on that one? I think I think that's probably the simplest of the bunch. Yeah, it's it's the, it's the standard he heroes arc. It's the journey that most characters take. They start here. I mean, oh, the anti-hero. You know, I'm, I'm a street rat. I'm an urchin, uh, and then yeah. I'm, the, I'm the Sultan of Agrabah or the Prince of Agrabah by the end of it. If you know, you take the Disney example there. What? But it, yeah, yeah, yeah. What? Aladdin. Aladdin's a moral like. Uh, I suppose he's moral. But, well, okay. He his... doesn't really have many moral failings to begin with. I guess no, he's no, a no. Thief. He does. He does though, because it, well, mm. he's a thief, thief. But what happens is he lies about his identity. Uh... Princess Jasmine, and then he, he just goes, "Oh, I should have been myself the whole time." Yes. So his moral arc is yeah. is learning to accept that he is a, you know, he, he is who he is, and he can't get away from that. And neither should, yep. you know, nor should he have to. And the and irony is that give... if he just, oh, go ahead, time. You know, he does give those kids the bread. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that, that's the thing. He's not like. I mean, it's it's a single failure. Yeah, yeah. It, it's sure, it's like sure. coming to it really when you look at it, it is coming to terms with him as himself, like accepting yeah, yeah. who he is and and presenting it is himself an as ascendance. That to the world. Yeah, I agree. It's, it it's an ascendance in, up. in one ver you know one vertical one parameter goes. Oh, I was here and now I'm here. You know. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Moral ascending, we love it. Staple of fiction. Moral ascending has an opposite. Unsurprisingly, this is the second type of moral arc. This is the moral descending character arc. Now, we might just assume <laughs> that this is just as simple and basic as the moral ascending. It ain't. It ain't. I'm going to argue that it's a lot more complex to write mm. and a lot more mm. tricky. Okay, so Alex, you're agreeing away. Why What? Why do you think it, it's more complex to, it's, to do It's well? more complex because you have to justify a reason for someone to almost objectively get worse. Yeah. And that's 
that's a really hard thing to justify in yeah. fiction. So the, uh, the, the example that I have um, that I, I've said before, and I'll say it again, my favorite descending moral arc is Harold Laudner from The Stand. Um, okay. That is the most fun example of a character like starting here and getting better. He's like, he's he, he's like, he starts as a little brat and then he sort of like works out and becomes more helpful. And then he kind of goes on this path of like, oh, like moral degradation. And then uh, eventually he's, he comes to this crossroads and he has the option to choose between two things. And he ultimately chooses the negative side and he he uh, is basically killed for that failing. Um, but it's a really interesting path to get there. Um, the, yeah, but it, but it goes back to what I said before. You have to be able to justify the fact that this person is objectively getting worse they, they're choosing to do something yep. that is not for the common good or, or whatever i i think the real skill in a descending arc is to have your reader cheer for that to have them cheer for the descending to to have them happy that that it's happening and i think the perfect example for that is the godfather by the time michael corleone starts whacking people you're like oh finally Finally, you know, he's he's getting it. He's okay. disillusioned. He understands who he has to be. Well, are we necessarily second... are we agreeing with the morality of the character, or are we just excited to see it on the yeah, screen? I think that's the work of a good writer. You got to okay. convince us that this is necessary. You don't have to. There are many ways to do this. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite, I guess, is when you convince me that the fish out of the water. The only way for him to breathe is for him to change into this, even if it's not the morally perfect. Even if morally he he, he had lost something, yep. he he had gained uh, dominion over the narrative. He had gained his victory. He has achieved his goals. And in the first Godfather, we are cheering when Michael Michael Corleone inherits his father because we didn't like uh, his brother's attempt. So the other, or basically, the alternative was worse. I think that's one way to do it. Yes, you are descending, but the other guy is this drug dealing pedophile. It's actually better that our guy, you know, gets his 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 hands uh, dirty he's still uh, superior to the opposition and then in the second godfather you kind of come to terms with the cost mm. you don't just slip get to the point you need and stop the slip doesn't stop the escalation doesn't stop mm. once yeah once you've gone there you will never stop yeah and, and that's when that's we can see the really more my favorite yeah i i totally a great if it's a main character there's almost a trick in so off I, i've stopped watching tv shows where i'm like well i don't like this character i think they're a bad person these people are all horrible and done i personally yeah, yeah. need to feel some i need to feel like i understand where characters coming from that i like them to a point i, I think everyone thinks that to a point so yeah you kind of there's <laughs> a trick to I'm going to say fooling, it's not fooling, but I'm going to say fooling the reader or watcher or audience into going along with the journey. And before they know it, well, my example is Breaking Bad, right? Oh, Walter yeah. White, mm. yeah, morally descending character arc, but all the way you can see the justifications and you can see why yeah. he's doing this and oh, he didn't mean to strangle that guy and <laughs> he was going to kill him he's, first and then... He's always... Is not always, but a lot of the time, Walter is morally superior to to those he opposes. Yeah, a yeah. lot of the time. Yeah, and the the the, the goalpost keeps moving, right? Yeah. At first, it's this low level, you know, drug uh, lord, and then it becomes like, uh, you know, neo Nazis by the end of it. That's who yeah. you have to bring in. You have to bring in the neo Nazis to make Walter White look good. Yeah. <laughs> so we almost That's forgive him happened. when he slight spoilers uh, puts a bomb in a old person's home in order to take out one of his rivals, which at the time yeah. I remember watching and like, you almost think like, yeah, get him, Walter. But you're like, wait, wait, what? Yeah, because it's relative, isn't it? It's, it's yes. relative to the alternative. This is better. And I think that's another uh, that's another part of it that you sort of brought up a little bit there, Matan, like the relative stakes need to be higher. It's like, yeah, well, you know, um, oh, why? <laughs> You know, why choose the lesser of two evils? No, no, it's the opposite. It's like, well, look, it, there's, there's, uh, it, it, you know, relative to what this other person or faction is going to do, I've got to kind of root for this. So it's that that sense of like, well, we got to compare them and see what's what. You know, totally. You got to boil. You got to boil the frog. Yeah, 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 yeah. Boil the who? 
Apparently boil that doesn't frog? actually happen. Like apparently frogs will not boil alive. Wait, yeah, it was struck something it wasn't yeah. true. Okay, so the 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 saying is boiling the frog because allegedly, although Alex just said it's not true, it's probably not. If you put a frog in normal room temperature water and slowly turn up the temperature, the frog will get used to the water and get used to the water and get used to the water and it will boil alive without leaving. I don't know who worked this out. Like whoever's boiling amphibians out there, stop it. Yeah, it's no good. Stop it. Stop boiling frogs, you sycophants. Yeah. Like, but if the... anyone listening to this right now is boiling frogs, we what? want you to know that that is a no go. Christmas fiction. And just know uh, that. Endorse... Know that we no. know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we, we know. We see you. We know. We see you. We're looking at you right now. We've made YouTube. this podcast just for this moment. <laughs> but my point is, you dial up the bad behavior in increments until the reader turns around and says, "Like, wait a minute, how do we get here?" And we're <laughs> killing children, yeah. and he thinks it's mm -hmm. a good thing. Great. Morally descending. Let's move on. There's more that we could say about that. And I think we there's actually some stuff that we can return to a little later in the year. But we got to get through this. So we've got the moral ascending. We've got the moral descending. But of course, not all character arcs involve morality. Sometimes a character just gets stronger. Or they just become the professional lawyer they always wanted to be. Or Goku reaches power I, I level of over 9,000. So I wanted to say Goku so bad. Yeah, <laughs> Goku was already a good guy. There's no moral. Yeah, Goku's moral journey is done. Like Batman, he he. Goku was the Batman of morality. He was just a great guy. But what can change? Well, his power level. That little number can always go up and up and up. If you haven't seen Dragon Ball Z, what what are you doing? Watch Dragon Ball Z. So this is called the transformational character arc. Nothing to do with morality, but instead it's a change that happens to the character physically in terms of their ability. Maybe they gain magic powers. Maybe they gain more skill or knowledge, something that changes and usually increases their ability to leverage power on the world around them. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Do, you guys, do you guys have any examples that, that come to mind when we talk about this sort of arc? <sighs> any anime hero, really. Yeah. Like, just, just like, it seemed, the, the way you've put it there, it seems simpler than the other two. Like, as soon as you take ethics so. and morality out of it, it seems simpler. I'm trying to think of a way that that uh that it, but it, it it seems more all inclusive like transformative like it could transform into anything but um i guess that's not really the way stories are constructed um, it, it's a, it's a broad brush but i still think it's a useful it's a useful category now because it is different to the ascending and moral and oh, the yeah, ascending. it is yeah yeah i, I, I mean, think it can Goku easily doesn't get any more moral yeah no no or less you can yeah. so easily pair it with those other two but i think it is yeah. something in and of itself um the example I saw online was, look, I it's been a while since I've seen the Hunger Games, but someone mentioned Katniss from the Hunger Games. Oh, that's that is a really interesting one. Does um, she change morally? Morally? No. Um let me let me think about how that works. So morally she doesn't change, she stays the same. Um she kind of becomes more aware, but what happens is by the end, the very end, she does uh, become more clued in to the to the machinations of the political factions, and she she actually uh, uses her her own influence to to affect that in a very physical way, like in a, a single action, yep. she sort of shoots like the, the main person, um, and then at the very end, it's kind of like oh, also we give her, you know, she's found peace. There's that, so there's that element of as well, like finding self fulfillment, I suppose. Peace through deadly force. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's, it's, there's not really a flaw. I, look, again, I'm, I'm going off what you just said and what I briefly read online, but it doesn't seem like there's a flaw within her that needs addressing. And so the the no, morality I, does not arc. I guess not. I guess there's not. It's, it doesn't It doesn't change her. She doesn't funk fundamentally change as a, as a character throughout it, except for the yep. fact that by the end she's like, well, I can I can live my life now and just not, you know, not have to kill people. I think this particular kind of uh, character arc is kind of dangerous, uh, and especially for speculative fiction, because it's very easy to say, oh, now he can lift a boulder yeah. before he could only lift a normal rock, so he's different. Mm. And I think, you know, when so many things are happening, when your character is learning a lot of things, when he's studying, when he's going through the hero's journey, you know, he's learning about the world, he's being mentored. It's kind of easy to to just have them go through the motions and like, oh, he's stronger now, so he's different. I think if if you care about that kind of thing and you're writing a story that's heavy on the speculative side, a lot of firepower and spells and mm. uh, super Saiyan forms, just try to imagine the character from the end of the book 
in the same scene as a car as that they were in the beginning of the book try to imagine even you can even write that scene how is let's say Katniss how is Katniss from the end of the third book going to re- behave in a scene from mm. the first book from early in the first book just I think that's a, a good uh litmus test for mm. yourself as a writer yeah is my character different agreed has he changed in any way has he learned anything is he is is he does he speak different does he behave different what would he have done different yeah has he been changed but by what he has experienced yeah don't don't equate power creep to uh to to changing as a character and I'll give you a good negative example of this I just finished this book and uh and it left me feeling a bit cold and I didn't know why mm. okay uh, but I'd, I'd sort of thought of it um ready player one um ah. good, good story good plot it's it's well constructed the world building is really good um but the character doesn't change at all not not even a little bit he yep. he gets he gets the girl like that's it like yep. he's already kind of smart and like knows all the video game references that he needs to succeed and by the end of it he's like oh cool like i did it and i did the thing it's like oh i got the sword and then i did it and it's just it's it's very uninspired in terms of character development i think Yep. Again, a lot of things that that book does really well, character development is not one of them. Yeah. A transformation lock without a moral descending or ascending. Yeah. I, well, it, it doesn't feel like there's any there's any change to his character. I, I, yeah. Like, I, I suppose I suppose that does have to be kept. It feels reductive to, to reduce it to an up or a down, like in terms of moral uh, ascending it, or descending. It does, but at the same time, like if a character overcomes flaws, yeah, it is reductive. You're right. But, you know, categories are reductive. If a character overcomes flaws in themselves, like personal failings, we, we count that as moral. So and mm. I suppose a character think, can have positive and negative. It can be more complicated. I, but I think the problem with this topic is that it's very easy to convince yourself that you have a character arc. Mm. Um, because the book that exists in your mind is not necessarily the book that exists on the paper. And that's yeah. one of the biggest problems with writing a manuscript that you see every day for 10 years mm. or yeah. five or two or five months. So you have this, you kind of fill in the gaps in your head and you are so intimate and close with these characters that some things are very clear to you. So I, I would recommend just like take it to your better readers, say nothing. Mm. Say nothing about how you think the yeah. characters change. Just yeah. ask them as a blank page. What do you think? Is the character any different? And if they say no, then use a flash. They haven't. But if if you look at some of the high Tolkien, let's go to Tolkien for a second. If you look at Lord of the Rings, um, a lot of the characters really change. If you take Aragorn of the end of the third book, he is he's still morally a good guy. He hasn't changed in that regard, but that is an Aragorn that is not running away from being king. He's willing to be king. He's not hiding in the woods. He's willing to care about more than just his uh, nearest environment. If you look at, at Sam, Sam has changed. He's willing to, to, you know, to lead, to do things by himself, not just to follow others. Gandalf mm. has changed, right? Gandalf used to try to, you know, handle everything by himself, run from place to place. By the end of it, Gandalf realized he needs to take a back seat and let humans deal with their own problems some of the time. <laughs> he goes from he Gandalf just- to Sorry, sorry. He goes from Gandalf the Grey to Gandalf the White to Gandalf the uh, Chill. Uh, ah, yeah. <laughs> nice. Well, actually, exactly. you know, that kind of leads into the next type of arc, which is the, you could argue this is not an arc, but we're getting listed as an arc anyway, the flat arc, where a character essentially does not change over the course of story. They are who are there in the beginning, yeah. the middle, and the end. And you mentioned Samwise and Gandalf because i don't know i think they i think there's an arc i think i think he's a lot more if it's an arc it's not much more than the curvature of the earth you know it's pretty subtle (laughs) pretty gentle i know that is damning by faint praise if ever i've heard of it (laughs) i'm I'm just saying put gandalf the white in that first conversation with saruman okay here's the litmus test okay fair enough good thing or bad thing though is a question because does a character need a character arc this is something i wanted to ask you guys flat arcs are a thing we already talked about batman i say gandalf doesn't know much of an arc yeah. i don't think samwise has an arc i think he's just always samwise and i think that's actually kind of the point of samwise do we always need yeah. character arcs he's a rock he's, he's a rock, a mr rock. frodo exactly I, he's I a potato make a, i'll make a controversial argument okay okay maybe we're not going to call it an arc but we are going to call it an arc we're going to call it a type maybe, of arc that's well maybe arc. i'm not going to call it an arc maybe <laughs> okay. i'm not going to call it an arc but if 
if your characters haven't changed throughout your entire book at all, nothing has happened inside your book. You know what? Nothing. You know what? I'm going to say, even if Samwise uh, doesn't change for the rest of the book, that one moment, uh, and I haven't read them for a long time, so, so I, I can't even... I've read the books I'll at all. Uh, so that one <laughs> moment where he's like, this is the furthest I've been ever in my whole life. <laughs> that is character growth. It is. It, it 100% yeah. is. Because he's like, yeah. I've done something I've never done before. Like, that right yeah, there he, is is character growth. Even if his he doesn't change. His speedometer ticked book. over. Paddy, Paddy, he solos uh, an entire orc tower. What are you talking about? <laughs> okay, well, maybe that's a transformational lock. You're right. Fair enough. Fair enough. So, I'm going to... I'm going to give you a few examples of situations that one might not need a character arc. You can disagree. You may disagree. However, let's just have this as proof of thought. But one. If a story is very short, I think in a lot of short stories, they're often, when we have character growth, it's best to make it slow because it needs to feel real. The character is slowly building incrementally on themselves. Mm. If a character, a story is very short, sometimes there's not time for it. Like, what do you do in a five page short story? Like, mm. there might be, you might see different sides to a character in the resolution, but are we can have character growth. Maybe not. I mean, I, sure. I would say, I would say, probably there would still be because character growth isn't necessarily this linear plot to plot thing. It's not point to point. Like character growth happens. You could ask, like it's it's kind of a Tony Robbins cliche, but like growth doesn't happen like over this long period of time. Growth happens if, over a very short period of time. It happens from going from point A to point B. When you make the ch- decision to change from one thing to one thing, that is growth. And most short stories, I would argue. Uh, have a character that makes a decision or does something that they they wouldn't usually have done or moves to a place that they wouldn't like. There's usually there, there's a point where they decide to do something, um, and I would argue that that is growth. Yeah, I mean that that's fair. I, I think you could consider that as growth. I think there's situations though where I would look at the situations you're talking in personally, not call it growth because it's just we're seeing the character in a different circumstance. But yeah, food for thought. Fair food for thought. Okay. Fair enough. Next one where we might not need. Uh, a character arc, potentially. Again, feel free to disagree. For minor characters, and again, I'm going to say C. Samwise Gamgee. Yeah, we can Did look... you just call Samwise Gamgee a minor character? <laughs> he is a... Yes, he's a main character. But let's talk about the non... MVP, the not... Well, let's talk about the non-main characters. Or even not Samwise Gamgee. What are even lesser characters than Samwise? If we have a character that comes in in several I'll scenes, give you a Pippin. in a story, I'll give you a Pippin. <laughs> I'll raise maybe, you a Pippin. <laughs> maybe. But let's have a, let's say we have a character that appears three times in the course of a book. Hmm. Tom Bombadil. Do, do they need growth? <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe. Yeah. Actually, yes. That's a good example. Um, easy answer. No. No. Guys, easy uh, answer. No. If you write in a book, spread your resources. Y- yeah. Okay. You you can't. Okay. So like, the more characters you have that grow go go through a big growth a big sense of growth the bigger your book's going to be see and yes this is the reference it's the second reference today actually um uh it by stephen king that's a big ass book because there's like like six main characters is it six i think it's something like that it's really big it's really big and the, if, if you break that down, it's because each of those characters has to go through their own arc. So you are just giving yourself more work the more people have have arcs, essentially. Sure. Yep. The book can't go on forever. I, I think I think Patty's point is really good. Uh, don't get obsessed with character arcs hmm. to the point that like Not every character has to have like secret motivation stuff. Like almost in a Western, you know, you have these facades, these fake houses. Be, be, be economical. You can't have every character learn something, but main characters probably should. Mm. Hmm. good point okay another example we've already touched on this actually this is us returning to it look at us look at us find the pin notes mm-hmm. when someone is already when a character's kind of an archetype or they already represent the thing that they are when they're a goku or a batman or i'm gonna say gandalf look i haven't read the books i'm no, gonna say okay. gandalf okay. right when a character is already that that static fully formed object i mean see personally i really like to play with that like i like to take an archetype and have them do something that's not expected. Um, that's that's a per, like a personal creative choice that I like to do. I like to start with something you know, and you're like, oh, this guy, I've seen this guy before. And then by the end of the book, you've had, had him do something else. Um, but yeah, no, it's it's a good it's a good stand-in, like just to be like, oh, it, it's it's what's what's the term? Uh, it's a good way of um, conveying a whole lot of information with very little. Uh, 
you know, for effort put in. You're like, oh, it's it, he's, it, oh, he's it's a cowboy. A, we get it. You know, like it's a symbol. It's a it's syllogism. No, no, no. Oh, there's a word for it. What is it? Uh, begins with S Y. There's there's an S and a Y in it. I feel like I'm playing Hangman now. Um. And anyway, I I, I can't remember. Synecdoche, maybe I can't. Remember. Maybe whatever it is, I think it is it's, a it's that. there's going to be people screaming into their screaming into their phones like it's yeah. smart, but that's fine. We don't know it. We don't know everything. I, I just wanted to say I think that can actually be a lot of fun. Um, if you have a character that is morally superior to their environment and the environment, you can have a story about a morally superior character refusing to to descend to its environment, and you can have the story be about is that character going to stay firm in front of that environment? Are they going to give up who they are or are they going to change their environment instead? You can have an environmental arc. Uh, that's a classic Superman mm. story, by the way. Superman is trying to tell us, I believe in humanity. You guys can be good. You guys can be brave. Mm. You guys can be good to each other. That That's a classic Superman story. He's trying to show us that... He's not going to change. We can change. Yeah. We can be better. Yeah, I like that. So maybe even if we have a character that doesn't change, make sure there is some change in the story. Or maybe a non-main character can change. Something yeah. like that. Yeah, like a reflection yeah, like of the main character. Yeah. yeah. There we go. That's some, Look at us dispensing advice. That's quite good. I quite <laughs> like that. Yeah. What about if we're writing something episodic or formulaic? Ooh. Like, does Jerry Two Seinfeld films. change as a character over the course of Seinfeld? <sighs> No, not really. If anything, he gets worse. <laughs> <laughs> well, Eddie, you know how you said we got to like characters to enjoy a show? That's my I? problem with Seinfeld. Yeah. I just hate them. Uh, I mean, that's fair because they're objectionable they're bad people. people. Yeah, I don't know why I like I it, though. It's great. I, I, I find, it's clever, but they're bad. They are. I find yeah. like I, I find like a, a lot of bad people on shows to be really engaging. I really enjoy the... I feel like it's it's almost like you're just looking, you just like really have to work hard to find the empathy for them. And that's almost okay. like a, yeah. almost like a challenge. I think, I think that's why I like say um, succession and you don't Patty, because yeah. I'm always like, Oh, but look, he did that one <laughs> yeah, thing. Yeah, it's yeah, not yeah. all bad. <laughs> and I'm know? like, Oh, I did one thing. Good. Yeah, on you, man. Yeah, like, yeah, Oh, bro, 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 the billionaire, you know, <laughs> yacht. <laughs> Playboy, like, <laughs> did a single good deed. Good gave, for fucking you. He gave a five out of a homeless man. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah. No, I, I'm in the minority. Patty, your here. point is very good. Like, sitcoms have that disease almost where the, the status quo has to be maintained and the dynamics mm. have to be maintained. And in fact, characters have been known to devolve into caricatures of themselves. Yeah, rather flanderization. Than yeah. yeah like, well, Homer Joey Simpson, has yeah. to stay dumb. Yeah, Chandler yeah, yeah. has to stay sarcastic. Otherwise, you, you lose something. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Or like Sherlock Holmes, you know, I haven't read all of Sherlock Holmes, but my guess, my understanding is that it's episodic. Sherlock Holmes is probably much the same person as he is at the beginning, at the end. And if he changes, it's probably just like the author's understanding of the character drifting rather than mm. a deliberate a deliberate change. So potentially we don't always need character changing author in uh, arc. episodic things. Sorry? Author arc. Author, <laughs> I like author drift. Arc. Sorry. Author arc. Wheels within wheels. Yeah. Okay. So look, those are some examples when, and you may disagree with this, but we may not need a character arc. Okay. So I got one more type of arc. This is sort of a bonus arc, right? Because it's sort of it's sort of the flat arc, but it's sort of not. We're going to call this the anti-arc. Now, again, this has been my mantra through this episode. I haven't read this book, but uh, the internet tells me <laughs> that The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Ooh. Dumas, I'm going to say. Quote, goes yeah. through significant trials and tribulations, but ultimately does not change his core belief in justice. And my understanding is like, it's when you get a character that, that things from the world are thrown at them. And it's almost like the world is, huh? You're going to change? Huh? Huh? But the <laughs> point is that they don't, despite the pressure. So it's oh, uh, almost yeah. like an anti-climax. It's, uh, is the character going to change? No, ultimately they're exactly the same. And that that's, that's sort of the point. Either of yeah. you guys have an example of an of an anti-arc. Yeah, uh, there's a Marquis de Sade story Ooh. about that. There's these two sisters and one of them's like committed to evil and she does really well and one of them's committed to be just and she just gets fucked on. <laughs> like, both literally and figuratively. <laughs> yeah, um, I bet. Yeah, uh, that's... I, I can't remember what it's called, but yeah, I remember reading that and like just 
yeah, they they just they just do that. And the moral of the story is like, no good deed goes unpunished. And it's like, okay, Mister Dassard, <laughs> <laughs> you say so. Classic <laughs> Dassard. You're a French marquis. I'm sure you know. Yeah. Very nice. Um, I'm just going to call this spite arc instead of anti arc okay. because that's what it feels like. And I'm going to throw in Hamlet as someone mm. who kind of, I mean, his indecision is one of his core elements. He's not really sure what to do, but that doesn't really change. And people kind of try to push him towards one one thing or the other the, to be a, a figure of vengeance or or to just kind of let things slide. But Hamlet basically uh, pushes back against any outside uh, influence at all. From the moment he meets his father in the form of a ghost after his father has been murdered, that's the last time a character really gets to Hamlet. Hmm. After that point, no one gets to Hamlet. No one influences Hamlet except Hamlet himself, hmm. uh, to everyone's detriment, by the way. But he does change. I mean, he does ultimately kill Claudius. Right? In fact, like... I would argue that that's not... I, I, I'll tell you what's my problem with that. Hamlet is only willing to take action one, it, once it has been confirmed that he's poisoned. Only after uh... Hamlet knows he's gone, mm. he's dying, he starts mm. you oh, know, that killing. Is a, that is a really good take. Yeah, He's, he's forced into a decision. We've got yeah. the English literature student here in the room. So this I haven't is some Hamlet, Hamlet university like wisdom. 20 years. But yeah, it's been yeah. a while. No, Hamlet is kind no, of a disappointment. I'm sorry, Professor Colvin, <laughs> if you're listening to that, please don't take points off my grade. And give us a five-star review. Yeah, I, great. I'm willing to accept that. I think that sounds like a perfect example yeah. of an anti-arc. All the pressures are on him to change, but he does not. And that's kind of the point. He doesn't yeah. do anything until it doesn't matter. <laughs> Until it yeah, doesn't he's got poison in his veins. It's like, okay, fuck it. I'm just yeah, sorry yeah. for the, yeah, just, yeah, he just he just rage quits. It's like All there right. we go. So the anti arc. Look, we're we're running. Time is running on, but there's one more thing that I want to touch on before we close this <laughs> bad boy out. But wait, there's another arc. <laughs> Call now, and you can have it. <laughs> and yet, no. This is this isn't an arc. This is an arc. This this is the seeds of change. The seeds of change. Now, again, can either of you guys guess what I mean by that and how it relates to what we're talking about? Uh, the seeds, the of, seeds change. of change. The seeds of change. So yeah. I'm guessing the seeds of change yep. is a uh, is an incident or character or idea or something that comes at the very beginning of the novel or book or play that sort of suggests the direction that the hero is going to take but isn't fulfilled until the back half, the back maybe third of it. Is, am I in, on the right Somewhat. Track Somewhat. I, th I think that's that is probably one example. But what I mean specifically is, um, let's say we've got uh, a character who we know that they're an abject coward. They're really not brave. They never stand up for themselves or do anything that could endanger themselves at all. And suddenly there's a burning building, and they decide now I'm going to be a hero, and they run in and save everyone. What what's wrong with that? I mean, that's um, kind of Hamlet having poison in his veins. Okay. Well, there's Fine. there's no. Hamlet aside, we've already decided but... that's not a great book. So you know, maybe it's a, an example. There's no, of... foresh... <laughs> not... there's no foreshadowing. There's no foreshadowing. There's no. The seeds of change are not within them. There's nothing mm. that we've been told about this story that suggests that this character could suddenly brave. Now, yeah. Let's pretend this character also their favorite TV show is about a superhero. Let's say Batman. Why not? And this superhero is always doing brave things. And this character yeah. loves the character, the, the hero for that. And sometimes they think of themselves, they dream of themselves as a superhero, but they think, well, that could never be me. I'm not brave. So then when they see the burning building, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I don't need to finish that sentence because it's it's obvious. Yeah. So what we should have with our characters changing is, and especially with a negative descending arc, I think, really helps if there is something within that character from the beginning that suggests the direction they could go so it doesn't feel i don't know well i guess i guess why we we like foreshadowing uh it feels more real perhaps um it's because we are given the keys to the it's it's okay mm. it is dorothy's red shoes is, mm. the, is the perfect example of that we're given the keys to the car at mm. the beginning despite the fact that we've been and you know we've been told oh no one can get into this car it's it's aware you know like that you've been given the way to access this thing from the beginning without um without realizing it and you've kind of gone this circuitous route to come yeah. right back to the beginning i like um, that chekhov's red so shoes yeah exactly exactly chekhov's red shoes that's a that's a good way of putting it 
Walter White, like for me, you know, I love Break. Everyone loves Breaking Bad. Walter White is such a great hero slash villain, and he absolutely has a negative descending character arc, no doubt. I don't think it would work. You know, at the beginning, toward the beginning, we learn like slight spoilers for Breaking Bad. Three, two, one. He had this. We know he's a genius chemist, but he's teaching like a high school, like no, no shade in any high school chemistry teachers out there but we're told that he had an opportunity to get in the ground on this like incredible business venture i think mm. it was going to be this chemistry company and that didn't go well so he's got this friend that did get in on who is now this millionaire yeah. and he's struggling to make ends meet and so he feels inadequate and insecure and he's got a lot to prove the reason i think we're told that in the show is because it provides the foreshadowing for, or the keys, I guess, to continue your metaphor, Alex, for everything else that happens. He's got so much to prove. And that's that's yeah. what pushes him to make the drug empire and do all this crazy crap. But he's going to show everyone he's the smartest man in the room. He, mm. The seeds of change are in him from the beginning. Yeah, so that's something. But, it, but it also has that conflicting thing of like, oh, well, I'm doing this to provide for my family. Which yeah. It really becomes, becomes sort of like a... Well, are you really? But yeah, you can you can play those things off against each other at least for the first couple of seasons and be like, oh no, well no, but it's like legitimately he does need to. And then it gets to a point where he's like, I'm I am the man who knocks, and it's like, oh, I see what this was, yeah, about, you know. But by that time, you're so invested that it's like, well, more power to you, well, you know. Yeah, exactly. I, I guess it's like the Godfather. Like it all seems like necessity, necessity, necessity. Like I'm doing what I have to, or doing it for the family, yeah. but. I haven't actually seen the third Godfather movie, but I'm assuming it's by the good. end, it's just kind it's of about one? Yeah. naked power. Not very yeah, good. the third one. Mm. Yeah, Is it good? I don't know. I haven't seen it. I haven't watched it. My dad wouldn't let me. He said, <laughs> there is no third movie. And he said, don't watch it. And I'm like, okay, dad, I don't want to risk go. our relationship for a movie. So Yeah, my mistake. There is no third Godfather movie. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, character arcs. I think we summed it up. Anything else we want to say on this before we before we close this up? Don't force it. It will. I think just be aware of it. Uh, let the story guide you. Let the events of the story guide you. Let the character. I know it sounds cheesy, but let the characters react to what mm. is happening to them. And if you know, if you pay attention to their heartbeat, you you will mm. you will see what is the way they should change. At least mm. that's the way it works for me. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'd say you only need one, one arc. You can have more if you want, but you only need one. Mm. Uh, only one character has to change in any significant way and that's a story you know yeah solid advice matan do you want to close us out with a quote there are a few things i want in life more desperately than to close us out with a quote oh. and the quote i have today <laughs> is from one mr uh winston churchill um Ooh. an english bloke maybe you guys heard of him <laughs> and he says to improve is to change but to be perfect is to change often. And here's a thought. Mm -hmm. Wise words from Mr. Churchill. Wise words. Yeah. Well, ladies and gents, if you've enjoyed today, please consider us giving a review. Consider us giving five stars even. The more stars, the merrier we get. And uh, feel free to leave a comment. Feel free to ask us a question and we will answer it in our next listener mailbag episode, which we do from time to time. We hope you've learned something about character arcs. We hope that's giving you some tools you can use when writing your own characters. Make them more archy. Well, thanks, guys. And to summarize, uh, Matan, what are the pros of character arcs? Some characters are just asking for it. And Alex, what are the cons of character arcs? Uh, characters can be real jerks if you give them descending arcs. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> actually, I, I think I kind of get it. You're listening to Pros and Cons, the Prespice Fiction Podcast.